Hey, welcome back to the Bible study. Again, we are here in our series on the seven letters to the churches that John writes to in the book of Revelation. In the words of the great theologian John Bon Jovi, we're halfway there. <laughs> And yes. we're living on a prayer at this point. Yes, we are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> so we're glad that you're here with us. I'm John Evans. I'm here again with Gabe Ross. And we are here to walk you through these next four churches that John writes to and are excited about you being here. And um, and so I just want to recap really quickly mm -hmm. uh, what we've looked at so far. We've looked at the letters of the church in uh, Ephesians mm -hmm. or the Ephesus. And we've looked at the church in Smyrna and we've looked at the church at Pergamum. And there's some characteristics that all of them bear that we're going to look at these next four, that yeah. they're going to see some of that. And uh, so anyways, as we walk through, we're in Revelation. Uh, we're still in chapter two and we're going to look at verses 8. 18 uh, through the end of the chapter as we look at the church at Thyatira. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's <laughs> jump right in and let's look at it. We're going to start out. Remember, if you look at the format that John uses as he writes, he always uh, gives this characteristic of Jesus here. So that's what he does as he opens up the letter to Thyatira here in verse 18. He says this, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Yeah, so the previous three churches, I mean, they they had their problems, uh, except for Smyrna, yeah. um, but they still were, were holding to their faith pretty well. Uh, you start to see some of these others who are struggling more so to right. do that. And so with the characteristic of, of Jesus here, this is the time where he's called the Son of God. Yeah. Usually it's Son of Man. Yep. Um, but I think here you've got this idea that God is gracious, mm -hmm. um, but you've got the combination here of judgment. Right. So that burnished bronze mm -hmm. is a symbol of his ability to overcome and stand on his enemies, right. to have that power and might. Yeah. But you have that with that Son of God, which comes to bring that hope and salvation. So it's this balance sure. of, I'm going to bring you some hope and give you an opportunity, which he does give them an opportunity yeah. to repent. Right. But if you don't, there's going to be judgment as well. And so that's that really cool symbolism uh, that's paralleled there. So he, he goes on again, holding true to the firm format that John's used previously. And he says this in verse 19. He says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. They're off to a good mm -hmm. start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing as Ephesus. Hey, right. great. This is awesome. You're doing well. You you love people well. That's the thing about this church is they are. And if you look at um, the people there, it's it's a little bit of a military town. It's a small church um, or a small city, and it's a military town, but you have all these artisans mm -hmm. who, who have these different works and these different trades and things like that. So it's almost like the sense of a communal place yep, right. where they care for and love one another well. Um, and so you've got that working here, and they're growing in their faith. But the thing that he highlights is also a little bit of the thing that they struggle with as well. I say a lot of times, a lot, our greatest strength is also our right. greatest weakness. Yeah. And um, so I think they push so far in one direction like Ephesus did, and they're actually going to be the opposite of Ephesus. They push so hard in one direction that they neglect the other right. piece to it. Right. And so they're out, they're working out their faith, but they're they're not really holding to the truth. Now they're getting better in their faith, but they're just not quite there yet. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at the things that, that here he says I have against you. So verses 20, I'm going to read through verse 23. Okay. It says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I'll cast her on a bed of suffering, and I'll make those who commit adultery to suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I'll strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Ouch. Yeah, it started out great yeah. and then fell off the track. Ouch. It, it fell off the tracks there. Um, so they, they again, they have this love for people, right? But that love has exceeded their knowledge and hold on the Scripture. Mm -hmm. So Scripture talks about Jesus being filled with truth and with grace. A lot of times we as people in churches tend to swing to one end of the pendulum. Yep. And this church, while Ephesus swung toward the end of knowledge and biblical understanding, yep. they've swung to the end of, we're going to just love everybody. Right. Doesn't matter where they are, yeah. what they come from. Now, you got some in the church who are, 
But in general, there's this compromise that basically says, God loves everybody. He's going to save everybody. We're just going to love them. And right. so they're they're allowing immorality in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, this is hard. This was a hard one Sunday to talk about. Yeah. What I say is, as people, we try to be people of the Word, yeah. and we say things are wrong according to the Word of God, not not our thoughts. However, when we have a close person, a friend or loved one, that is walking in a specific sin, what happens usually is we diminish our yeah. hold on the truth yeah. so that we can open our hands and accept the person. Yeah, Where Jesus was able to do both. He tells the woman, hey, caught in adultery. You shouldn't be sinning anymore, but I'm going to forgive you, so don't sin anymore. I, I'm going to do both. I'm going to tell you the truth, yeah. and I'm going to love you at the same time. And the most loving thing to do is to tell you the truth, right. but I'm not going to do it in a way that just completely chastises you or or, or just kind of shames you. Right. I'm going to love you well, which is to tell the truth. Where everybody else was ready to stone her yeah. um, because she was less than, Jesus says, no, 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 no. They, they have sin too. We need to deal with the sin. I'm not here to shame you or put you down, but you need to know if that sin doesn't get rid of your life, you don't rid yourself of that right. through the power of the Spirit, then you're going to be consumed, and, and the eyes of flame will consume you with your sin. Yeah, I mean, you you hit on something right there. Like We have to understand that the truth is love, mm-hmm. right? Like yep. If we really love somebody, we'll tell them the truth. Yeah. But there is a balance between grace and truth there. Yeah. That, that the church has to has to maintain. Mm-hmm. We have to be grace-filled people in our right. approach to things, but we have to tell the truth. Absolutely. And we have to tell the truth in love. So that segues really nicely into those next two verses because if you look at verses 24 and 25, mm-hmm. it appears that there is some within this church who are doing things the right way. Right. Okay, so let me read that. So verse 24, it says, Now I say to the rest of you, mm-hmm. right? It's, 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 here is excluding them in the previous verses. Right. Here it says, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. And he says this in verse 25, and this is what we have to grab onto. Mm-hmm. He says, only hold on to what you have yeah. until I come. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it just says that just because some people in a church are living one way doesn't mean everybody is right. or has yeah. to. Yeah. And and so some are holding to the Word of God and some are allowing this compromise, which <laughs> brings up another hard topic, yeah. church discipline. Yeah. Like, who's the leader of this church? Who's the star, the yeah. seven stars yeah. that's leading this church that's allowing that to happen? Right. And so... We think we're loving somebody by accepting their sin. Um, And I think the same thing can be true of ministers or leaders, that if we don't address a situation, we think we're just kind of allowing it to be brushed to the side. But we're really not loving the church because we're called to shepherd the church, which he's going to get into in a minute, which is this idea of ruling with with an iron rod. Um, We're not doing our job as leaders and pastors well. If we're not engaging in church discipline, and you don't go looking for it, right. but in this sense, it's it's starting to work its way through the church and causing a little bit of a division, right. and it's causing people to love sin right. instead of call it out and love truth in a grace-filled way. And so uh, there has to be church discipline when it's this large. It right. doesn't seem like it's small. This yeah. is a big thing sure. that's um, really harming this church. Yeah. And the leader obviously either doesn't have the ability or the courage to work through that with the people. It appears, just based on the way that the writing is here, is that the majority are living in opposition to what mm-hmm. the Word says. Right. They have become so grace-filled, if you want to, but so yeah. accepting, yep. inclusive, whatever you want to call it, that they have discarded what the Word of God says. Yeah. So it appears that this group that is living according to the Word of God is probably the exception, not the rule here, Right. Or with regards to this particular Church. Okay, so he talks here. He he addresses specifically. You hold on until I come. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then he goes into verse twenty six. Twenty six, and he talks about uh, something that's a commonality that I'm going to talk to talk about when we get to the last church. But he says to him who overcomes and mm-hmm. does my will to the end, mm-hmm. I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give him mm-hmm. the morning star. Yeah. 
So so there's that ability to to rule where it seems like there isn't a leader in here that's able to right. have authority yeah. over this church. Yeah. And and you're not looking to as a minister, you're not trying to put your thumb on people and right. control no. people. But if you love that body, you have to shepherd it well. Yeah. And so that idea of the the iron rod there is that you would rule and you would take false doctrine and you would rid the church of it. Yeah. You, you would call it out and you would remove that as a shepherd among the people. And so that's what he's doing here. He's talking about this this ability to, to rule over the nations and have this iron rod to do so. I, and I think, too, I want to go back to what you said just a minute ago with regards to church discipline, because that's extremely difficult, especially in today's culture, mm-hmm. right? It just is. And however, I think that you and I have such strong held convictions about shepherding our people well Mm -hmm. and stewarding well what God has given us that there are times when this has to happen. There are times Mm -hmm. when we've had to do this Mm -hmm. and it's not out of hate. It's not out of, you know, anything. It's not driven by anything else other than a shepherding of our people Mm -hmm. and doing that well. And there are times when you have to, sometimes you have to say, We're not going to let you do that. You're not going to impact our church in a negative Mm -hmm. way or cause them to stumble in any way. We have a responsibility to that. And again, I'll go back to, I feel like we take that, that very, very seriously. And so I think it's important for us to, but here that was evidently Mm -hmm. missing. Right. For sure. All right. So let's conclude this letter to this church by verse 29, just reading it. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So any concluding thoughts? And then I'm just going to plug our last episode, the church of Laodicea, because I'm Mm -hmm. going to talk about that statement that Jesus continues to make over and over again and how we should apply that. So, yeah, I'll just go back to that, that refrain, um, you know, to all the churches, let him hear. And at the beginning in chapter one, he says, you blessed is the reader, blessed is the hearer, Mm -hmm. but really you're blessed when you do. Right. And so he's telling us, you need to listen. Yep to all these churches so you don't fall into these. You right. may struggle with this, but so you don't struggle with that. You need to hear what I'm saying, uh-huh. my correction, my reproof, right. to bring you back to full health and reconciliation. So I think he's just reminding all the churches, because we're easy to go, oh, they struggle with that, I don't. Right. And you know, Paul talks about that in Galatians. Be careful that you don't fall into temptation while you're caring for somebody else. And so I think it's just a reminder, you need to hear what's being said so that you can then live that out. Yeah, I agree. Okay, good. Really good stuff. So, again, there was a couple of plugs there for you to continue to tune in with us because <laughs> we're going to cover these next three. And on that last one, we're going to dive really deep mm-hmm. uh, because there's a few things that, again, have played a theme throughout this uh, these letters here that I want to explore a little deeper. So that's the church at Thyatira. And then we're going to continue in the next installment with the church at Sardis. And so really excited that you've joined us as we continue to to trudge through this um, Alpha and Omega series as we walk through the book of Revelation. And can't wait to see you at our next installment at the church of Sardis.